We're going to go ahead and get started this morning, so if you'll make your way to your seats. Still got a bunch of people coming in. All right. Well, the choir is still rolling in. People are still being seated. Hey, good to see everybody. Good morning. Good. So glad that you could come and be with us today. And um, before I get into too much this morning, I want to say a very special happy birthday to our Minister of Music, Kevin Butler. Amen. Hey, Kevin. Yeah. And uh, he's got his whole group over here. They have been partying. They have a huge party. Man, I didn't know you had so many friends, Kevin. Uh, but uh, anyways, they've been, they've been gaming. And I always like to add to that because they're bored. They're bored gaming, you know. But anyway, uh, good to have all of you folks with us this morning. It's good to see everyone who's come on this uh, Memorial Day weekend. And if you are our guest, uh, even Kevin's guest, uh, we, we welcome you. And in the pew in front of you, you will find a guest card. If you'll take time to fill that out for us, we would appreciate that so much. Um, I do want to uh, make mention of uh, Miss Barbara Grubbs. All of you knew her and knew her husband. And uh, this past Friday, Miss Barbara passed away. So uh, we want to be in prayer for the family. Um, I was told to mention that there's going to be a graveside service this Wednesday at 11 o'clock at Sardis Cemetery. So that's this Wednesday at Sardis Cemetery. And I know we got a lot of people out because of the holidays and all of that. But if you know somebody that knew her, uh, if you would give them a call and let them know about this, I would appreciate that. Well, excuse me. It's at 11 o'clock, 11 o'clock on this Wednesday, okay? Um, but y'all be in prayer for the family. And uh, by the way, we've got some flags. If you didn't get one, be sure to get you a, a flag. You'll notice I did get the kind of the little ball on it rather than the point. I was thinking about all the kiddos uh, that, that might uh, want to use it as a sword or something. But uh, anyways... Uh, be sure to get you a flag. We've got plenty of those and because uh, we certainly want to uh, remember uh, back those who have given the ultimate price for us on this Memorial Day. And uh, as we gather here this morning, uh, we want to do just that. And in a moment, we're going to have a special time of prayer. But before we do, I have a, a short video I'd like to share with you concerning Memorial Day. So watch this along with me. My fellow Americans, Memorial Day is a day of ceremonies and speeches. Throughout America today, we honor the dead of our wars. We recall their valor and their sacrifices. We remember they gave their lives so that others might live. The unknown soldier who has returned to us today and whom we lay to rest is symbolic of all our missing sons. About him, we may well wonder as others have. Did he marry? Did he have children? Did he look expectantly to return to a bride? We'll never know the answers to these questions about his life. We do know, though, why he died. He saw the horrors of war and bravely faced them. Certain his own cause and his country's cause was a noble one, that he was fighting for human dignity, for free men everywhere. Let us, if we must, debate the lessons learned at some other time. Today, 
we simply say with pride, thank you, dear son. May God cradle you in his loving arms. all of our veterans. Amen. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we're truly grateful and, and thankful, Lord, that we can stand here today, Lord, free, Lord, free to worship and to... Uh, express our honor and, and praise for you. And God, I know that that is only possible today because of those who are willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice that we might uh, be able to enjoy these freedoms. Lord, we thank you for those uh, families that uh, made those kinds of sacrifices in the past. And Lord, I, I thank you for those who are still with us today, Lord, who have served our country so faithfully, uh, Lord, so that we can enjoy these freedoms today. And uh, we just pray that uh, as we gather together here this morning to worship you, that, Lord, uh, we would not only remember those who, who died for our country, but, Lord, that we would remember what it is that you have done for us. Lord, and given your only son to die for the sins of the world. And I pray, Lord, that we would honor him here in this place this morning. And I pray, Lord, that uh, through the gospel message, through Jesus Christ, that someone might come to know you as Lord and Savior of their lives today. And God in heaven will praise you for all you do. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. We are glad to have you all here today and uh, joining us to worship. I am thankful for all my friends that are that are here that came to, to worship with us as well. And uh, we're just going to sing some songs of praise to the Lord. We are going to start off with a song, the song, My Country, Tis of Thee. Probably most of you all know that. And uh, if you would, if you would stand as we sing these songs together. My country, tis of thee. Land of liberty, of thee I sing. Land of my father's side, land of the pilgrim's pride. From every mountain side, let freedom ring. My native country, the land of the new. I love thy rocks and hills, thy woods and temple hills. My heart with rapture fills, like that above. Our fathers God to thee, author of liberty, to thee we sing. Long may our land be thine with Freedom's holy light, protect us by thy might, great God our King. Sing to the King who is coming to reign. Glory to Jesus, the A song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up the heart of praise. Sing 
now with voice and praise to Jesus, sing to the King. For His returning, we watch and we pray. We will be ready, the dawn of that day. We'll join in singing with all the reed. The Satan is vanquished, and Jesus is Come, let us sing a song, a song declaring we belong to Jesus. He's all we need. Lift up a heart of praise, sing now with voices raised to Jesus. Sing to the King, sing to the King. Please remain standing for the reading from God's Word. The reading from John 12, 35 to 36 and 44 to 46. Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of light. Then Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he, and he who sees me, sees him who sent me. I have come as a light into the world, that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Yeah. 
crushed and then beaten and then crucified. His followers fled while the people they mocked him. He bore our afflictions as on prophesied. Glory to Jesus, we take it our place. Praise to the Father. Mercy and grace, for oh, you sent us your spirit to be near again. For yours is the kingdom forever, amen. Death met its match, so the grave couldn't hold him. And just like a ghost, he appeared to his own. His hurricane spirit empowered the people to speak revelations beyond what they know. Glory to Jesus for taking our place. Praise to the Father for mercy and grace. For oh, you sent us your spirit to lead again. Yours is the kingdom forever, amen. All the kingdom, all the power, all the glory is yours forever. All the kingdom, all the power, all the glory. All the kingdom, all the power, all the glory is yours forever. All the kingdom, all the power, all the glory is yours forever. Singing glory to Jesus for taking our place. Praise to the Father for mercy and grace. Oh, you sent us your spirit till we meet again. For yours is the kingdom, and yours is the power, and yours is the glory forever. Amen. Glory to Jesus for taking our place. Praise to the Father for mercy and grace. Oh, you sent us your Spirit till we meet again. For yours is the kingdom, and yours is the power, and yours is the glory forever.
Thank you. We do indeed stand in awe of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And that is why we are here today is to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no mistake about that. But as we uh, gather, as we do at different times of the year, uh, where we take time to uh, for special events, and uh, especially as it relates to our nation, uh, we 
This weekend, we're celebrating Memorial Day weekend, and tomorrow we will celebrate Memorial Day. Uh, you know, we should thank God for our freedoms, amen? I mean, you know, I've, I've had opportunity, Marcia and I both had opportunity of visiting a lot of other countries. We've been overseas and that sort of thing. And folks, uh, even with all of its issues and challenges that we face today, the United States of America is still the greatest land in all the world, hands down. And uh, we must never forget those who made that possible for us and those who have given the ultimate sacrifice, giving their very lives. As I've come to realize, and the older I get, the more real it is to me that freedom comes with a cost. It is never free. On November 19, 1863, President Abraham Lincoln gave this speech on the, battle, on the battlefield of Gettysburg. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but we can never forget what they did here. It is for us that the living rather to be dedicated here to do the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thousands and thousands of men lost their lives in the Battle of Gettysburg. But let us not forget those as well who have fought since then. When we think about Iwo Jima, Normandy, Korea, Vietnam, we think about the Gulf War and all of the wars since and some of the fighting and struggles that still go on in our world today that we have brave men and women putting their lives on the line. Folks that so that you can sit here freely today and worship. We must never forget them. We must never forget those who have given their very lives. We must realize that if freedom is to be carried on from generation to generation, then we must be willing to pay the price for that freedom. Why? Because freedom is never free. It always costs something. Before forgiveness takes place, there is always a price to be paid as well. And with that in mind, I want to read to you a story from Luke's Gospel in Luke chapter 7, verse 36. And we will begin in Luke 7, verse 36, and read through verse 50. So stand with me in honor of reading God's Word as we look at this story. Luke chapter 7, beginning with verse 36. The Bible says, Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house, and he sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her, her tears, and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with a the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor, Jesus said, who had two debtors. 
One owed 500 denarii and another in the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Verse 44. Then he turned to the woman and he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has ceased has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little was forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless the preaching and the reading from your word today. I pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts and challenge us, Lord, and help us to understand, Lord, the great price that came for our freedom from sin. Lord, I pray that today that uh, we would see that what Jesus did for us, we could have never done for ourselves. And Lord, this morning, I want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for saving me. And Lord, saving so many that are here today. And Lord, I pray that we would never forget what Jesus has done for us. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated. A Pharisee invited Jesus over to eat. We don't know what his motives were exactly, except that uh, he had probably observed and he had seen some of the things that Jesus had done. And he was a religious man, and so I guess he thought it was appropriate to have him over for a meal. But for the most part, the Pharisees and the religious people saw Jesus as a threat to their power and their political status. However, we're told that a woman who had lived a sinful life Heard that, heard that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So this woman brought an alabaster jar, as we read, of perfume and stood behind Jesus where she broke the perfume onto his feet, uh, poured it onto his feet. She was weeping. She took the hair of her head. She wiped and she cleaned Jesus' feet. She then began to wipe tears from his feet with the hair of her head, as we're told from the Scripture. Then she began to kiss Jesus and poured the fragrant perfume on his feet. By this time, we know from the story that the self-righteous Pharisee is having a cow. I mean, he cannot imagine why Jesus, who he maybe, at some, maybe he was already thinking he could be perhaps a prophet, how he could possibly allow this to happen, this sinner. And I want to point out to you that everyone knew that this woman was a sinner. That was the stigma that she lived with. He should not have let her touch him, or at least the Pharisee thought so. With that, I want to give you this morning three, three propositions. Number one, every one of us is spiritually in debt. Every one of us is spiritually in debt. Every one of us is a debtor. Every person in this room is in debt to society, to our nation, and to our God. And we must not forget this. Every person in this room is in debt to society, to our nation, and to God. You see, every one of you who are sitting here is here because of somebody else. Think about it. You are here because of somebody else. Now, we can think about biological reasons why you're here, and if, had it not been for your mom or your grandmother and, and so on down the line, sure, you would not be here today. But it's also important to understand that if it had not been for men and women in the past who've gone to battle and give their very lives for you, I would not be able to stand in this pulpit today and preach, thus saith the Lord. 
That would not happen. There are people in your society. There are people that work in government. There are people that work in our schools and, and, and just all facets of life that have poured their lives into you and to others. And because of that, we can stand today. It's because of what others have done before us. I would submit to you that no man, no woman stands here today on their own merits. Listen, you're here because of someone who has come before you. If it had not been for those who came before us, we would not in, be able to enjoy the freedoms that we have today. We would not be able to buy and sell as we choose today. We would not be able to have board games on the weekend today. We would not be able to do what we want to do. We wouldn't be able to travel today freely here and there. But it's because of those who come before us. And by the way, we would not be able to worship here today had it not been for some who have gone before us. We can never repay those who came before us, but we must be willing to give back to our generation that's here and to the generation that's to come. You see, when you're in debt, it's important that you remember who you're in debt to. Simon, in our story, he was a Pharisee, and he must have thought he was a pretty special guy. I mean, after all, he's got this very popular guy, Jesus, who may be a prophet who has now come to eat dinner with him. He must have thought to himself that, uh, that he was doing pretty good. I think that maybe Simon was thinking, you know what, Jesus, you're pretty lucky to have a Pharisee like me invite you over to dinner at my house. Uh, he's a special guy. Simon seems to have forgotten one thing, though, and that is that he was a sinner. You see, he was a sinner, and yet he doesn't seem to understand this, and Jesus is going to make this very point. He may have lived a good life, but folks, his sins were sins of the heart, and the Lord Jesus knew that about him. Simon knew what the Bible had to say about our righteousness over in the book of Isaiah. The Bible says that all our righteousness is as filthy rags before a holy God. So there's no one who can stand before a holy God and declare their own righteousness. We can't do it. Because you see, there is an infinite gap between us and God. Our holiest of holy life and the lowest of low God, we cannot reach God because He is holy, He is pure, He is righteous. So none of us are righteousness. The Bible says our righteousness before a holy God is as filthy rags. It seems that Simon forgot about this. He knew what the Bible had to say over in Jeremiah where it says the heart is deceitful above all things. How many of you have heard on TV and when people are talking about other people, how many times do you hear people say, oh, they're a good person? You know, and people even say, you know, inside of all of the human race, there, there's goodness. In that, and, and we should expect nothing but the best. Do you know the Bible does not support that idea? The Bible tells us that we're wicked to the core. We are sinners against a holy God. Simon forgot this as he sat there before the Lord Jesus. The Bible says, and it puts it this way, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means you, that means me. Every one of us is sinners. This woman in Luke's account of events report that she was a sinner. Verse 37 in our text says, And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table of the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil, and the story goes on. But the point is, is that she was a sinner. Now, I know, and many of you have encountered people who thought that they were pretty good people, but I've also had those encounters with people who, when I talk to them about coming to church or relationship with the Lord, they say, "My, you know, if I were to walk into that church, the roof would cave in. You've, you've heard that kind of thing. I've had people that, that will readily admit, yes, I'm a sinner. I know that I don't, I don't even see how God could ever look my way because of my sinful, sinful life. This is where this woman was. She understood that she was hopelessly lost. 
She understood that she was a sinner, and that was her reputation. There was no denying it. There was no doubt about that. But I want you to know something. There was no difference in her sin and the sin of Simon's. Simon was just as much as lost as she was lost. And the difference being is Simon didn't recognize it, apparently, but this woman knew that she was helpless and she could not help herself. She had a deep-seated debt and apparently, I don't know how the Bible doesn't explain it, but she knew that Jesus Christ was her only hope. You know, I can't help but believe that the Holy Spirit of God was already working in this woman's life and she'd probably heard these stories about the Messiah coming and God had touched her heart. God had spoken to her through the power of the Holy Spirit and she knew that if there's any hope for me at all, it's going to be because of this man. So as a sinner, she came before Him seeking forgiveness. And of course, we know that He gave her that forgiveness. So she had a deep-seated debt and she apparently knew that Jesus was her only hope. Only He could help. Isn't it easy to forget how indebted we are to those who paid the price for the freedoms that we enjoy? There were many who came before us who paid a tremendous price for our freedoms today. There are men and women, as I speak, who are still paying that price. And we must never forget that. We owe a great debt to those who have gone before us. And we must never forget. In the United States of America, there are many who have forgotten or never learned about the cost of freedom. And folks, it's a time where, that you and I, as citizens of the United States of America, that we return to where we were years ago and we remind people again as to why we're here today. We need to help our young people understand that there was a great cost for our freedom. We have people all across our land today who think nothing about trampling on the flag of the United States of America or burning the flag of the United States of America. And they have no clue what they're doing because I believe that if they did know, if they really understood what it was that they were doing, then it would not take place. We have people in the United States of America who hate this country. But thank God for the United States of America. Listen, we as a free land have been able to go around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ because of the freedoms that we enjoy. I don't know about you folks, but your pastor is a patriot and I love the land in which I live. And I'll never turn my back on this great country. And those Many who fought for our country in the past, we must not let them down. We must continue to fight for the United States of America. Why? Because we have freedom. And, why do, and what, is, what ha comes from that freedom? A freedom to worship. A freedom to tell others about Jesus Christ. A freedom to reach our world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen, there are people every day who wish... They could have the freedoms that we have. People in China who wish they could own a copy of God's Word and freely share it with others, but they cannot have that. We must never forget. We must remember. We must remember. We owe a great debt to those who've gone on before us. And folks, for the most part, I know as a nation we're in trouble and we're a nation that has forgotten God. We owe a great debt to our God we owe a great net debt to Him for what He has done for us. And the freedoms that we have today are a result of those who've gone before us. Yes, but folks, let us not forget the debt that God paid for us, for us to be here today. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Aren't you glad God gave? Aren't you glad that God gave us this wonderful gift in His Son, Jesus Christ? You see, we're all debtors and we owe a great debt to Him. God, forget, God forbid that we forget what it is that Jesus did for you and I. Listen, maybe today you haven't heard this, but God offers to you 
salvation as a free gift. The Bible says that the gift of God is eternal life. You can't work for it. You don't deserve it. We've got cults all over our world that teach you must do this and you must do that if you ever hope to get to heaven. But that's just not true. I wish, and I was telling somebody this just yesterday, I wish that I could tell everybody, if you don't tithe, if you don't come to church, there's no way you're going to heaven. But I can't do that because that's not Bible. But this I do know. That if you come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you receive the free gift of God, then you're not going to have a problem doing the things that God asks you to do. But you're going to do it out of a willful, willing heart because of a love that you have for the Lord. So the gift of God is eternal life. And God loves you and He has a plan and a purpose for your life. He loves you with an everlasting love, the Bible says. But the problem between us and God is that we are sinners. We have all sinned. How did God solve our problem? He solved our problem in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. He sent Christ to the earth to do what you couldn't do and what I couldn't do. And that is pay the price for my sin. And He did that on the cross of Calvary. And it's in faith that we receive what God has done for us. We repent of our sins and we ask Him to be our Lord and our Savior. And He saves us. And then we're promised everlasting life. The Bible says, These things have I written to them that believe on the name of the Son of God that they might know that they have everlasting life. Man, what a wonderful God we serve. That He was willing to do that for you and to do that for me. Let us not forget. Let us not forget what it is that Jesus did for us. We are spiritually speaking in debt. And by the way, we can never repay that debt. I've already alluded to this. Verse 39 says, Now when the Pharisee who had invited him, that is Jesus, saw this, he spoke to himself saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is, touching him for she is a sinner you know when i think of the debt i owe my forefathers and i realize it's a debt that i can never repay but by the same token when i realize the debt that i owe my god in heaven for the price he paid for my sins i realize that i can't pay that either this sinful woman in our story came to jesus weeping broken over her sin and in effect was crying out to Him in the only way she knew how that she might receive forgiveness. And by the way, folks, she was doing the only thing that she knew to do. She was doing all that she knew to do. She wasn't trying to somehow earn favor with Him, but because... Somehow, some way, she knew that he was her only hope. She was doing what she could. Basically, I think, maybe in her heart she was saying, because you love me, the least that I can do is love you. And this was the way that she was showing her love for the Savior. And folks, that's all we can do. We can't pay God back for our salvation, can we? We can't, but we know He loves us. And we may never never fully understand how to love Him the way that we should. But folks, we need to do our best at that in that we show our love for Him, for He first loved us. We don't earn our salvation by doing good works, nor do we keep our salvation by good works. But when we come to Christ Jesus, out of gratitude and out of a love for Him, we do the things that we do. We can do what He asked us to do. Well, what did Jesus ask us to do? You say you love the Lord Jesus. What did Christ ask you to do? He said, if you love me, what? Keep my commandments. If you love, you want to know how you can show Jesus you love Him? Keep His commandments. Keep His commandments. Hey, there was, a, you might remember when, when one of the religious leaders came to Him and says, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus' response was this. And you shall, what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And then he goes on and he says, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. 
There is no other commandment greater than these. So you want to know how to show God that we love Him? We love Him with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with everything that we've got. And then we love our neighbors. That is, every man, woman, boy, or girl in the world. We show the love of God to them. And we love on them as well. What are you doing that exemplifies your love for God? What are you doing that exemplifies your love for God? You see, you can work 20 hours a day for the Lord and still not love Him the way He has asked us to. We can work 20 hours a day and we will never earn favor with God. That's not the way it works. No, we repent of our sins and ask Jesus to be our Savior. And then we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. And then we love our neighbor as ourselves. Most people I talk to are under the impression that if somehow they can do enough good that somehow they can outweigh the bad and the, the wickedness in their life and that God will find favor in that. But I want you to know something. If one day when you wake up in heaven and you stand before a holy God and He says to you, why should I let you into my heaven? And you tell Him it's because you're a member of a church or you were baptized or you sang in the choir or you taught Sunday school or you lived a good life. I want you to know something. He's going to say to you, depart from me because I never knew you. The only answer we can give him is because I repented of my sin and I asked Jesus Christ to be my Savior. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Listen, you and I, we are hopeless before a holy God apart from the Son, Jesus Christ. It is Christ and Christ alone that saves and listen, that's how we know that we can have eternal life and that we can live forever. It's because we put our faith and our trust in Christ. We must never forget the, the price that was paid. The price that was paid for our sins. And the third proposition I want to give you is Jesus Christ paid our debt for us. Verse 48, the Bible says, Then He said to her, your sins are forgiven. Don't gloss over that verse this morning. She was a sinner. Simon knew it. He was quick in his heart to point that out. The implication is everybody knew this woman was a sinner. But what does verse 48 again say? It says, then he said to her, Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. Can you imagine what must have rushed through her body? What, what she must have felt to, to feel that great weight relieved from her body, released from her? What do you mean, my sins are forgiven? Listen, the, the implication is if she was a sinner, that she had lived a wicked life, she had outwardly shown and displayed sin in her life, and now you mean all that is gone? What Jesus was saying is, I'm washing the slate clean. I'm giving you a fresh start in life. You are a new person from this day forward. You have been forgiven. And you know what? Jesus wants to do that for somebody today. He wants to do that for one of you today. And maybe for the first time in your life, I, I just want to encourage you to give up on what you've been trying to do and throw yourself at the feet of Jesus and understand that He is the only one who can declare to you, your sins are forgiven. Your slate has been washed clean. It's not something you work toward. It's not some progression in your life. No, you come to a place and a time in your life where you realize that you are a sinner and you are lost and on your way to what the Bible calls hell. But Jesus is ready to say, I forgive you. I forgive you. I cleanse you. That's what He did for this lady. He said, I forgive you. Listen, we all stand in need of forgiveness. The good news is that forgiveness is available to everything, to everyone. I'm reminded of the last thing that Jesus said on the cross. As Jesus says He was nailed to the cross of Calvary. You've, you've read the story over and over again. And Jesus hung there and before He drew His last breath, the Bible says that Jesus, He hollered out, He said, It is 
finished. To tell a sty, which means paid in full. I have paid. I am the fulfillment of everything that's been written before I came. I am that fulfillment. I am the Lamb of God. I am the perfect sacrifice. It is finished. Folks, your debt is paid. And it was paid on the cross. The Lord Jesus paid that debt. He was the only one who could pay that. You say, Brother Allen, how can you say that? He was just a mere man. No, he wasn't. The Bible declares and Jesus declares all through the Gospel of John that if you've seen me, you've seen the Father in heaven. The Bible says that Jesus, and as we read the Gospel of John, it says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word being God. God came and He took on flesh. He was holy. He was righteous. He was without sin. And I want you to know this morning, He's the only one who could hang there and declare to the world, it's finished. It's paid. It's over right here on the cross. I'm glad the story didn't end there, aren't you? <laughs> Jesus died for our sins, but He rose from the grave. And He lives forevermore. And praise God, we're going to live with Him if we have a relationship with Him. Jesus Christ paid our debt on the cross. The price was paid, but folks, I want you to know that it cost something. It cost God the very best that heaven had to offer in His Son, Jesus Christ. When God says, I forgive you of your sin, it costs God something. You see, before forgiveness, there was Gethsemane. Before forgiveness, there was pain. There was agony. Before forgiveness, there was the cross. Before forgiveness could come, there was death on the cross the burial and the resurrection. But a price had to be paid. The ledger had to be cleared before forgiveness could become a reality. But now forgiveness is available to all who seek Him. And folks, that's the good news I have for you this morning. Is that every person in this room can know God, can know the Lord Jesus Christ and have a relationship with Him because He paid the price for you. But isn't that also true? of our freedoms today. We're here today because somebody was willing to pay the price. Freedom is never free. It always costs something. Forgiveness is never free. It costs God something. There's always a price that must be paid. Listen, we need to remember the price that was paid for our freedom and we need to thank God for the freedoms that we enjoy today. But most of all, let us never forget what God did for us on the cross of Calvary. And the freedom that we experience today as a result is spiritual freedom. Because we are forgiven of our sins. And the Bible says that God imputes His righteousness to us as if we had never sinned. We put our faith and our trust in Christ. And He invites you today to come to Him for a relationship with Him through the Son, Jesus Christ. I hope that if you don't know Christ as your Savior, that this morning you will come to Him. And you'll come to Him for salvation. I promise you, He'll save you. He'll not disappoint you. You can know Him today. Would you pray with me? I see a lot of faces of people I don't know here today. And you know where you stand in your relationship with God. I'm not your judge, that's for sure. But folks, God knows your heart. There's nothing you can hide from Him. He knew this woman that came to Him. He knew that she was a known sinner. And yet He was willing to forgive her. As I stand here today, I want you to know that God's willing to stand, or God is willing to forgive you as well if you'll come to Him for salvation. Maybe today you want to come to Christ for salvation. In a moment after I pray, we're going to begin to sing. And when we do, I want you to know that the invitation's open. 
We invite you to come today for salvation. Perhaps today you just want to come to this altar and pray. Maybe you haven't thought about it much lately. I asked the question a while ago. It was really uh, something that Jesus said. How, how does God know that you love him? Keep his commandments. Maybe, maybe your relationship with the Lord is not what it needs to be. Maybe you just need to come and pray this morning. And ask God that to forgive you. And get you on the right path and headed back in the right direction. Do you love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind? you love your neighbor as yourself? Listen, whatever your need this morning, God, His love is broad enough to take care of it. He already knows your heart just like He already knew the heart of this sinful woman. He knew Simon's heart too. Maybe today you want to come. Whatever your need, come. Father, thank you for this time we've had together this morning. Lord, as we've just taken a few moments to think back and to remember those who've gone before us, who've given their very lives for our nation. God, we thank you for them. But Lord, more than anything, we want to thank you because you came and gave your life. Lord, not that we could just enjoy our freedoms, but that we could spiritually enjoy our freedom in Christ and have a relationship with you and, and know that, Lord, when we draw our last breath here on earth, that we're coming to be with you. Thank you for Jesus Christ. Help us to never forget what he did for us. Lord, I pray this morning that there's someone that's lost that needs Christ in their life. I pray that today they would come trust Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of their lives. Father, we'll praise you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's all stand together. As we stand, as the Spirit of God speaks to your heart, you come as we sing. Won't you come right now? Come on. As we sing. I life, lead me, Lord. Take my life, lead my life useful to thee. Take my life